Hi everyone. Thanks for joining me for this message on Rivers of Justice. Our scripture is going to be from Amos 5:24, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. God bless the reading of his word, the word of God for the people of God. A simple matter of justice. Deputy Marsha Wagner was performing her afternoon patrol of the Parable neighborhoods. It wasn't terribly hot, so she had the windows down in her cruiser and was enjoying the late summer air. And the routine that she had was more about letting the community know that the sheriff's office was keeping an eye out for them. But Deputy Wagner thoroughly enjoyed interacting with the people that she encountered in the community. Parking the cruiser under a shade tree, the deputy got out and started to walk around the block and stretch her legs. Patricia Danner's kids, Francine and Nicholas, were out playing in the sprinkler in front of their house. Maria Gonzalez was busy tending her garden. Several children had started up a game of baseball in an open lot that they often used. Stephanie Nash was washing her daddy's car, slinging bubbles everywhere. She stopped to chat with Paige Turner for a moment, and Paige was walking her dog Chipmunk, a cute Yorkie with an unpredictable temper. Now, Marsha's conversation with Paige was cut short when the deputy heard two people squabbling in a, a few houses down. And giving Paige her apology, she quickly uh, took her steps down the sidewalk to find the source of the noise. And she was surprised to find Tommy Ballard red-faced and shaking his fist at Janice Sanchez as he tried to maneuver past her. Now, Tommy owned the owned Pete Bar and Grill and was known to get himself worked up on occasion over uh, trivial matters, but, but Janice was one of those the most soft-spoken people in town. And the sheriff decided that she should probably step in before things got ugly. Tommy had a cloth bag with him that was filled with peaches. He looked like he was about ready to blow a gasket. Janice was standing there between him and his car, fist firmly planted on her hips and not giving an inch. She had planted her feet and it was obvious that she had no intention of letting Tommy have access to his automobile. Hey, hey, hey now, what's going on here? Deputy Wagner spoke out with authority. Tommy, you back up right now. I'm not gonna ask you twice. Janice, uh, I know you're upset, but I want you to come over here away from Tommy while I, I get to try to get to the bottom of this, okay? It was clear that Tommy didn't want any interference and stayed where he was, his anger now turning towards the deputy, but Janice did as she was told and moved away from Tommy, giving him plenty of distance. Deputy Wagner moved toward Tommy letting him know that he needed to stifle the attitude or this conversation was not going to end well for him. He lowered his fist to his side and relaxed just a little. Now, Tommy, what's going on here? What has you so riled up? I just wanted to borrow a few peaches from this tree, Tommy mumbled. The deputy looked at the cloth bag that Tommy was carrying. It seemed that what Tommy meant when he said a few peaches was actually several dozen. Now you just stand right here for a second, Tommy. The deputy swung around to chat with Janice for a minute. This is your house, isn't it, Janice? She inquired, and Janice meekly nodded. So that would make the, this uh, your peach tree, right? And Janice shuffled her feet and nodded again. Did you give Tommy permission to pick the peaches he is holding? No, ma'am. I mean, deputy. I mean, uh, I just noticed him taking the peaches to his car and I tried to stop him. But I didn't hit him, Marsha. I just, I just stood in his way. He didn't like that very much. No, I would think not, Janice. Okay, uh, just, just wait here. Give me a minute with Tommy. Okay, deputy. The deputy turned back to face Tommy. She thought she had figured out what was going on. Looking at Tommy directly in the eye, she, she asked, did you ask Janice 
if you could pick those peaches, Tommy? Now, why would I do that, Deputy? They're just hanging there. They weren't behind a fence, and there weren't, weren't any signs. But, Tommy, you know this is Janice's house, right? Well, of course I do. Everyone knows where Janice lives, and for the record, it's... If she didn't want people picking her peaches, she should have done something to protect them, like put up a fence. Uh, so, Tommy, said the deputy, if you feel that if someone were to come over to your place and pick several dozen peaches, you wouldn't have a problem with that, would you? I would have plenty of problem with that, deputy. I'm saving those peaches for the Peach Festival. I plan to beat out John Gottmeyer this year. He won last three years, but not this year, no siree. I even have a sign out near my trees that says, Don't pick my peaches. It's as plain as the nose on your face, and if you, I were to catch someone picking my peaches, well, they're liable to get hurt. Those are my prize peaches. Janice never enters her peaches in the fair, so she really... She really doesn't need them. I do need them because I have company coming and I'm making some peach cobbler. Marcia rubbed her forehead in disbelief. If Tommy hadn't been so threatening, this matter might have been laughable. How could anyone believe that this was legal or, or even moral? Tommy, why don't you just go down to Big Sam's and buy some peaches to make your cobbler? <laughs> Tommy laughed at the idea. Now, why would I do that when these are right here and don't cost me anything? The deputy could see that Tommy felt no remorse for what he had done. There wasn't even a hint that he felt he was in the wrong. Tommy, I think I've heard enough. You really don't understand that you can't do this, do you? You don't realize that you're stealing from Janice. It doesn't make any difference that she doesn't have a sign up. This is her tree and her peaches. You should be ashamed of yourself, Tommy. But, 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 no buts, Tommy. The question now is what am I going to do about it? The deputy motioned for Janice to join them. Janice, the deputy said calmly, it's obvious that we can't put the peaches back on the tree. So here's what I suggest. Why don't you just let Tommy buy the peaches from you? I guess that would be all right, assuming I get a fair price, Janice replied. Okay, so how much are the peaches over at Big Sam's Market? Oh, they're, they're way too expensive over there, Tommy blurted out. He gets two fifty a pound, and I would never pay that much. Well... We don't have a scale here, said the, the deputy, so we will have to price them by the piece. And I'm thinking, uh, well, I think about two bucks a piece should cover it. And how many are in that sack, do you think? Well, and Janice looked and said, uh, looks to be about four dozen. That would make it to be around, uh, what, $96. Oh, let's make it an even hundred, said the deputy. That's robbery, shouted Tommy. I'm not going to pay that. Never. Well, let me rephrase it this way, Tommy. You will pay Janice $100 for those peaches. Because if you don't, I will arrest you right here and now for theft. And with it being Friday, you won't be able to see Judge Trudy until Monday. So you'll be locked up for the weekend in jail. Come Monday, she assuredly will find you guilty, since I will be more than happy to testify. And when she does, she may keep you in jail for a bit longer and find you for the offense, uh, for the offense and, and, and car, court cost as well. Shouldn't be more than four or $500. Uh, unless, of course, you find a lawyer in town willing to handle your case, which you will obviously lose anyway which will then put the cost in the thousands. And, and here's the thing. You will stand all, still end up paying Janice $100 for those peaches. That's blackmail, deputy, and, and I, I, you, you won't get away with it. No, Tommy. It's justice. You wronged Janice. Can't you see that? 
and you can either compensate her here and now, or we can do it the hard way. But Marcia held her finger up to Tommy's lips to, to shush him. Now open up your wallet, Tommy, because that is the only thing keeping you out of jail. Tommy pulled out his wallet and reluctantly handed Janice the money. Nice doing business with you, Tommy, Janice said as she smiled and danced back into her house. The sheriff and the judge are both going to hear about this, deputy. You aren't going to get away with this. Oh, they're going to know about it long before you tell them, and, and you will be lucky if they accept this little arrangement instead of going ahead and throwing the book at you. Have a good day, Tommy. Deputy Wagner turned and walked back to her cruiser as she dropped in behind the wheel. She felt pleased with her solution. She wasn't sure how it would all work out in the end, but for the time being, justice has been served. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. You know, the, the prophet Amos is one of the 12 minor prophets. Now, I hate that term, minor prophet, because it really just means that the, his book is shorter than a major prophet. But saying that someone is a minor prophet sounds like a downgrade, and it's not. Now, Amos lived around the time of Jeroboam and Uzziah, about mm, 760 BCE. And he never claimed to be a prophet. As a matter of fact, Amos tells us about himself in Amos 7.14. Amos answered Amaziah, and I was neither a prophet nor a son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. He was an in-your-face, reap-what-you-sow, divine retribution kind of guy who championed the poor. Amos constantly sought justice for those who had been denied justice. In a time where the rich and powerful were always favored by the justice system, he was a lone voice calling out a more, for a more balanced approach to justice based on truth. And as a Christian, you just got to love this guy for his forthright approach to, the right, to righteousness and justice. Amos was a cross between Don Quixote and Martin Luther King at a time in history when such an attitude was extremely unpopular. This is the kind of guy that I would want on, uh, on the Supreme Court, someone who can call out the wrong and injustice in the world for what it is and not let the average Joe get trampled under the shoes of the rich and powerful. He says, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. In our, story, in our story today, if Deputy Wagner had been in a larger town, she would never have been able to handle the situation the way that she did. Small town justice can look different from the justice found in a larger town where people aren't as familiar with everybody. Now, I'm not a fan of vigilante justice, but I think everyone must have a superhero in their mind that they admire who doesn't hesitate to step in to protect people from injustice. <clears throat> We're taught in school that justice is tied to our legal system, that justice is blind. But as we grow older and wiser, we see that such a notion isn't always the truth. A legal judgment can be un an unjust judgment. The system can be manipulated by lawyers and judges who turn a blind eye to justice for whatever reason. It happens more often than we tend, and we tend to lose faith in our legal system because of it. That justice is often elusive, especially if we live within the, the impoverished ranks of society. Having said that, I want to state that I believe that Americans still have the greatest legal system on the planet, in spite of its faults. We talked about red-letter Christianity recently, and if we are confused about justice, how to approach the situation as Jesus sees it, 
Jesus talks about justice in Matthew 23, 23 through 14, and he says this, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guys, you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. What in the world is Jesus talking about? He's telling us how easy it is to get our feet tangled up in the strings and cords of the law without ever dealing with the most important matters. He's telling us that while it is important for us to have a giving heart and to follow the law that God gives us and helps us be faith, it helps us to be faithful and true to his righteousness. If we forget the important parts of the law, though, the reason for the law, the spirit of the law, the justice, mercy, and faithfulness that come with the law and observing the nature of the law, then we fail. And if we become so focused on the minutia of the law, we will forever fail to see the big picture because we are staring at our tangled feet. Now, God's law was never meant to turn us into mindless robots that only follow orders. Instead, it is presented to us to provide guidance as we seek to demonstrate justice, mercy, and righteousness to those around us. God's law was never meant to be a sword that we wield against those who differ in their beliefs, but instead it is a guidepost reminding us of where truth, justice, and mercy should abide. God abhors injustice. When we participate in acts of injustice, he is deeply disappointed with us because it breaks a basic tenet of our covenant with him. We are to pursue justice, not just for ourselves, but for everyone. Defend the weak and fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. You'll find that in Psalm 82, verses 3 and 4. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Isaiah 1.17 He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Micah 6.8 Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. Matthew 22, 36 through 40. How can justice prevail in this world if we fail to step into the expectations that God has for us in our service to his children? That's what I'd like for us all to think about this week. How can we do better fighting the injustice around us? How can we lift people that are struggling and hurting? How do we teach each other to embrace justice? How do we example justice? How do we example the bravery it may take to step into situations that we find uncomfortable in order to secure justice for others? All good questions for us to examine and contemplate. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. God bless you all. Amen.